in front of the neighbor's house. But uh, it's good to see everybody tonight. I'm glad you could make it. Um, we're in Hebrews chapter 10 this evening. Last week we went through chapter 9. Uh, we covered the meaning and the function of a testament. It's a legal document uh, that takes effect upon the death of the testator, the one who the testament belongs to. Um, Jesus' death being of, of such a higher value than, than the deaths of the animals of the Old Testament was what effectuated a New Testament. Okay, so, so Jesus superseded the Old Testament with his sacrifice. And, and because of that, there cannot be another testament. Okay, so you've got the Old Testament, which God put in place. Could as, you talk a little louder? Yes, ma'am, I'm sorry. You have the Old Testament, which God put in place by the sacrifices of the Old Testament, which kept it in effect. Uh, and then you've got the New Covenant, which is our agreement with God that we have by our faith in Jesus Christ, which is the testament that keeps it in effect. Um, but we're going to pick up with Hebrews chapter 10 tonight. Reverend Brooks, sir, would you please pray over our Bible study this evening? Good, Father, thank you for this Bible study tonight. God, bless everyone here in attendance. Bless us to watch that you teach us your word tonight. Give me the praise, honor, and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Chapter 10, verse 1. For the law having a shadow of things to come. And remember, we had said uh, that... Uh, as we covered chapter 8 and chapter 9 and, and bringing it through the priesthoods and, and, and showed how the things of, of the Old Testament were temporary, they were always meant to be temporary. God put them into effect for a certain span of time, showing that man's own efforts, even man's best efforts, were not enough to merit God's favor. So where it says, having a shadow of good things to come, it was intended to show that something better was on the way. Okay, so coming down again, chapter 10, verse 1. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with the sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to have been offered? Because the worshippers, once purged, should have had no more conscience of sin. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifice for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offerings for burnt offerings for sins, uh, thou wouldst not, neither hadst thou pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then he said, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. And that statement once and for all is just, a, again, a point that reiterates what we emphasized last week, that there cannot be another testament that will be put in place because as the nature of a testament being one that's in effect based on death, Jesus is not going to die again. His sacrifice was once and for all. But, but these first 10 uh, verses of chapter 10, they sum up the purpose in God coming as a man. It's so that he would be our sacrifice. And through this passage that we just read, he quotes a few places of scripture from Isaiah, from the Psalms, from different places where it spoke of God coming to be our sacrifice, God coming to fulfill the order of the old sacrifices and to bring in a new order. God always showed that that first system was meant to be temporary, that something better was coming. And here in the book of Hebrews, Everything shows that Jesus is better. Yes. The better is now here. We have something far better in Jesus than had ever been available to God's people through the times of the Old Testament. Amen. Okay? God doesn't give his people any type of half measure of sustainment. Any type of half measure of sustainment. When he initiated the Old Testament, it was only to show that the works of man were insufficient. He said, I'm going to let you prove to yourselves that you can't do it yourself, and then I'll come in and do the rest of it for you. You're going to have to see, because otherwise you're going to accuse me of saying, we could have done it ourselves, God. 
But I'm going to give you all of these generations to prove to yourselves that you can't do it on your own. And then I'll come in and do it for you. Okay? That's why he came. That's why in Psalm 51 it says, Thou desirest not sacrifice, else I would give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Even David, when he wrote this in Psalm 51, he was under the terms of that Old Testament. He would go to the temple himself and offer the sacrifices. It was incumbent upon him for his own sin to offer an animal, the blood of which would atone for him for that time. Okay, But he realized, God, this isn't good enough. I'm doing it because it's what you require of me in the meantime. But what you really want is for me yes. to be right with you. Amen, amen. Okay. In Micah chapter 6, the prophet said, Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for the transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? He said, what's the best sacrifice that I can give God? The best animals that I've got. I could give him all of them. All of the oil, all of the luxury items that I've got. I could give him all of it. The firstborn, my, my own children, I could give everything to God. What's the best sacrifice that I can give God? Is this going to be good enough for my salvation? And then he follows, his, follows it up. He says, he has showed thee, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of thee? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. The prophet Micah, he said, God has this system in place, but what he really wants from us is for us to live right before him. Even when uh, the prophet Samuel uh, was dealing with the king Saul, and, and Saul had gone in uh, to, to follow out or to carry out something God had commanded him to do, and he was disobedient in it. He brought certain animals with him afterwards, and uh, Samuel confronted him on it and said, what is this that you're doing? And he said, this is going to be my sacrifice. Hmm. And, and Samuel said, no, you've done everything wrong. You've done everything contrary to what God told you to do. And, and Saul, again, he argued. He said, no, this was going to be my sacrifice. And, and Samuel said, obedience is better than sacrifice. Obedience sure. is better than sacrifice. Yes. God, all the time, for all ages wanted his people to be right with him, okay? That's right. Now, during those times, and even today, okay, a sacrifice, the, 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 the innocent blood was required to cleanse a sinner. Now, we've already talked about how our sacrifice is in Jesus Christ. That's what chapter 9 covered, and, and chapter 10 is, is continuing. But the sacrifice was necessary. Those animals were necessary so that when a sin was committed, the person would bring the animal to the tabernacle, to the temple. It was necessary to cleanse the sinner. Okay? Uh, but it could not re uh, redeem them. It could not, it could not purify them. It could only deal with the sin on a case-by-case, event-by-event basis. Okay, that's why something better, that's why something complete had to be offered. That's why these prophets, they, they, they considered and they, they spoke with God and God spoke to them and they wrote these words and said, God really wants us to live right. And we're going to get to a couple of other places where it speaks about God putting his word into our hearts. He, he went through, or they went through these, these, these times of, of considering God and, and writing what God spoke to them saying, what God really wants is for us to live right for him. But we, we don't have the way to live right for him because these animals, they cannot purge us of our sins. They can only deal with one event at a time. Okay? So something more was necessary. And that was Jesus Christ to come once and for all Amen. to be that sacrifice for sin. Chapter 10, verse 11. Every priest... Standeth daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, 
from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is witness to us, for after that he uh, said before, This is the covenant that I make with them that are after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. He says, you don't have to keep coming back to offer sacrifices over and over and over again because I've dealt with it. Okay. But it talks about verses 11 through 14, talks about those priests standing and, and offering the sacrifices day after day, year after year. The, the, the priests of Levi, uh, the, the high priests that were Aaron's descendants, they offered you know, they're at the tabernacle or at the temple. They would they would be waiting there, and and the people would bring up their sheep and their 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 bowls and the things for the sacrifices, and and they would offer one person's sacrifice, and then they would you know go through the rituals that were necessary, and and then they would stand there, and, and the next person would come along, and they'd offer the next sacrifice, and then the next person would come along and offer the next sacrifice, and the next day they'd go through all of it again, and some of those same people that had sinned the day before would be back because they'd sinned again and they'd have to offer the sacrifices again and some other ones. And, and just day after day, day after day, sacrifices after sacrifices after sacrifices. They weren't able to sit down and rest from their work because their work was never over. Their work was never over because the people's sins were never purged. Right. But Jesus, it said, that he sat down at the right hand of God, uh, henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. So right now he's sitting down at the right hand of the throne of God. But he'll get up again when it's time to judge those who have not accepted his sacrifice. That's why it's talking about sitting down from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool because that time of judgment is coming again. It is coming. And, and then he's going to get up again. That's something that's covered in Revelation and other places. So but he's sitting we down pray, now. We say our Father in heaven. Our Father who art in heaven. Art being the same thing as our. Art. Art, A-R-T. Okay. It's, it's old English. In, in newer versions, it just says R. So that means R not R. No, R. A-R-T. Is, is, is in heaven. Is, not, is. is. He is in heaven. Okay. And Jesus is sitting at his right-hand side. Yeah. Yep. That's his place. Verse 15, chapter 10. Whereof the Holy Ghost uh, is a witness for this because he has said, this is the covenant that I will make that with them in those days, saith the Lord, that I will put my laws in their hearts and in their minds I will write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Okay, the old covenant, remember a covenant is an agreement between God and his people. The old covenant was kept on uh, man's end by the continuing of the offerings of the animal sacrifices. Okay, that was the Old Testament. The Testament was... The sacrifices, the animals, their debts kept it in effect. The New Testament is in effect based on our faith in Jesus as our sacrifice. Okay, His sacrifice once and for all. Verse 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, a new and living way because Jesus gave his life for a sacrifice, but he didn't stay dead. Right. He rose again. John chapter 10 talks about how he said that I have the power to t lay down my life and I have the power to take it up again. This commandment have I received of the Father. He said, I, I lay down my life for the sheep. Okay. But uh, during the uh, time of the Old Testament, the Old Testament priests, the high priest, just one man. There was only one high priest at a time. The high priest was the only one who could enter into the holiest place of the temple. If you imagine uh, the temple was laid out, the tabernacle was laid out essentially the same way, just a big rectangle, okay? And in the middle of the rectangle, it was it was kind of a big fenced off area, and it was there, there was a big courtyard area. And then in the middle of it was a tent, and the tent was divided in two halves. And the first half, uh, only the priests could enter in, okay? The people just couldn't go in there and see what was going on. But inside there, there was there was a table with showbread, and there, there was uh, candlesticks, and there was incense burning. There were different things that pertained to the worship of God that the priests would take care of. Okay, but then there was a big curtain right in the middle of it, 
and that was called the veil and it was very ornate it was uh, uh embroidered very finely with with uh silk and different things um but uh on the other side of the veil was the ark of the covenant and the high priest would go in there once a year with the blood of the sacrifice of atonement once a year okay that's the only time he could ever go in there the high priest was the only one who could go into the holiest place of the temple. Jesus, our high priest, made a way for all people. Not just the one high priest right. once a year, but Jesus, our high priest, made a way for all people to enter into the presence of God through him. Okay, That holiest place of the temple was the place where the presence of God would meet with man. Okay, But God meets with us wherever we are when we call upon him. That's right. Okay? It says in chapter 4, which we covered a few weeks ago, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That was, at, again, at the end of this passage, speaking of Jesus being our high priest. Okay, And then in Matthew chapter 27, when Jesus was crucified and he cried out with a loud voice and, and uh, it said, it is finished. It says, behold, the veil in the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom and the earth did quake and the rocks rent. That means that in that temple in Jerusalem, where there were surely high priests gathered around because it was Passover time, there was an earthquake and that tent, that veil that was in the temple that separated the place from only where the high priest could go to everybody else, it was torn in half when Jesus died because Jesus made a way for all people to go. And it wasn't just like somebody came along and if, if I was in a room where there was a big curtain hanging, I'd go and I'd grab it wherever I could reach it. Well, God grabbed it where he could reach it at the top and just tore it in half. He opened it up for everybody to come in. Okay. Verse 21, having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart. Jesus is our high priest. Let's draw near because he's made a way for us to get close to God. What a privilege. How many of us just out of sheer, uh, uh, to say curiosity might simplify it too much, but just out of sheer thinking, it's amazing. Just out of sheer thinking, it would be so cool to be the one to go into, would just love to have that position of being the high priest to get to go into the uh, uh, holiest place of the temple. So what if it's only once a year? I would just love to be the one that was chosen to go and do that, wouldn't you? That would just be an honor. Let alone if it was open for I'd anybody. Be to go in. <laughs> but if it was your uh, position that God had called you for, brother, that would just be yeah. the honor of, of of the of the nation. And and to say that that God is has allowed me to go in there. How many of us would love to have that? And and now that it's open for everybody, we should draw near. He says, "We have a high priest over the house of God. Let us draw near with a true heart, full of assurance of faith, not being afraid of God." Even as he said in, in Hebrews chapter 4, and, and as we, we discussed, that, that, that yes, it, it, everything's open before him. He can see his, his word is uh, powerful and quick and, and dividing us under the uh, thoughts and intents of the hearts and the things that we covered back in chapter 4, that God knows who we are. He knows what our motives are. He knows what drives us to do the things that we do. He knows even when we fall short, the reasons why we fall short. He knows what our weaknesses are, but he also knows that we're trying if we're trying. Yeah. Okay? And so for that, he said, let us come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy to find grace in our time of need. Okay? Because he knows that in coming to him, he's got it for us. Where else are we going to find it? Who else are we going to turn to but to him? So let us come boldly to him because there's nobody else that we're going to get it from. All right. For salvation, there's nobody else. There might be people who would excuse us. There might be people who would dismiss us, say, oh, what you've done hasn't been as bad as what I've done. And so they'll give us a pass. But God's not going to give us a pass if we don't come to him for that grace. Amen. Okay? But having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart full of assurance and faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. That's talking about how when the priest would offer the sacrifices, they would have to be sprinkled with blood. That was part of their consecration, their ordination you could say as to become a priest they would go through a ceremony where they'd be sprinkled with blood from a sacrifice but then every day they'd go through a washing they'd, and it would it became more ceremonially significant than it was meant to be uh, and that's even what Jesus uh, rebuked the Pharisees for talking about you go through these washings and, and the, the Pharisees tried to get on the disciples about they were plucking 
and, and eating from the fields without going through these washing ceremonies because it was not meant to be anything more than, hey, these priests are getting ready to take on uh, their tasks of the day. They got to take a bath first. Mm -hmm. That's what it was. They had to wash their clothes and take a bath and be clean to get into the house of God. But, but he says, look, if, if we're going to be serving God, if we're, we're going to be uh, not, just, uh, not just physically as they were, but we're going to be spiritually pure and holy and clean before God because he's the one that makes us pure and spiritually uh, clean. Uh, more than we can make ourselves. More than we can make ourselves. Okay. Now listen to this. We're getting to, everybody knows this is the pastor's favorite verse in the Bible. Right? Everybody knows Hebrews chapter 10, 25, verse 25. Every pastor's favorite verse in the Bible, because this is the one that says, make sure you go to church. Yeah. All right? But it, it leads up to it, and it has a purpose about it. it. It's more than just going to church so the pastor sees you there. Mm -hmm. Okay? I'll cut to it really quickly. It says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Okay? Everybody hears that from their pastor from time to time when he wants to make sure that you're all in church. And, and you should be. But listen to the reason that he put that in there. It's talking about how, look, God has made a way for us to come into his presence. So if he's made a way for us where before it was so limited, why would we not want to take advantage of that? It's, it's to put it on a much lower, an, an important level, but a, a, my goodness, a much lower level. We, we have the right to vote in America. We've got so many rights that people did that were that were born with or that are just inherent to us here that a lot of people seem to take for granted and, and because they're there we're so just accustomed to knowing that they're there people don't exercise those rights or or people just dismiss them and and, and say oh, it's not important yeah. but uh i've been to a lot of places in the world where where people are oppressed yeah. and don't have those rights and and have family members of course i didn't talk to people who were killed for him because the people who were killed for him were already dead. But uh, the people whose family members were and friends had been killed um, attempting to exercise those rights, uh, attempting to assert those rights. And, and it's something that they consider to be very important and, and worth fighting for and worth living for um, and uh, exercising. And it's, it's kind of one of those things where just with the perspective that I've seen in other places of the world. Now I, I cherish those rights and the things that we have here much more dearly than I did when I was growing up. Okay. And, and it's, it's kind of the same thing that, uh, that, that is being brought out here is that if you just have the perspective that before that the access that people had to God was, was so limited, the, 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 uh, the grace that God dispensed for, for forgiveness was, was so strictly, uh, regimented that now that it's it's free just by faith in Jesus Christ, why why take it for granted? We should rejoice in it and and not just rejoice in in knowing that it's out there, but we should we should take as much of it as we can. We should live in it. We should adhere to it. We should as as he's going to come to in a moment. Um, we should we should we should uh uh well we'll get to it. Um, but he says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith. Let us, let us hold on to it, not be shaken from it. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith uh, without wavering. For uh, he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another, uh, provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So in light of all that the book of Hebrews has shown us up to this point, how Jesus is better than any uh, dispensation of hope that had ever been presented to mankind before throughout all the history of mankind, that he is our high priest who has perfect empathy toward us, and he loves us so much that he gave himself for us, and that through his sacrifice, our sins are washed away. We're purged of our sins without the sacrifices having to be repeated through our own strengths so that we only come up short in failure of our own salvation through, through all of these things and through the knowledge of all of these things and seeing how it's been brought to us. My goodness, this is how we're supposed to dedicate ourselves to him. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, in, in considering one another, 
uh, in loving one another, provoking one another to good works. That means encouraging one another. You, you know, you see kids sometimes provoking one another unto fights. You see kids sometimes provoking one another onto to dares to do stupid things. He says, we're supposed to provoke one another onto good works. Hey, you can do that. Hey, why don't you help me do this? Hey, if I do this, that means you can do it too. Provoke one another to good works in love. Holding fast to the profession of our faith. Nothing is going to shake me from my faith in God. Nothing is going to shake me from the confidence of what he has done for me. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. But exhorting one another. That means encouraging one another. Speaking things that uplift one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. That means the closer it gets to him coming back, which is closer every second. We ought to be all the more ready to get together with his people. Okay, Back in these days, uh, even when the book of Hebrews was written, under New Testament times, the, the church customarily got together one day a week. All right, Now you go to most of the churches around here, and they've at least got a Sunday morning and something else. Okay, We're about to get a building. We, I should say we've already got the building. Uh, I had a meeting today with a, with a man that's coordinating all the contract stuff. Things are going well. But once we get everything set up, we'll we'll have Sunday morning, Sunday night, we'll have a Bible study in a midweek at a minimum. Okay, so that's Sunday morning, Sunday night, Bible study, midweek. That's at least four services where we'll be assembling together. Mm -hmm. You say, well, that's a lot more than, than they had in their day. Well, we've got a lot more easy modes of transportation than they had in their day also. Okay, so we got a better excuse to get together than they do. Okay, but more than that, we're a lot closer to the day of his coming. Mm -hmm. So much the more as you see the day approaching. Yes, sir. Yes, okay, sir. so we're going to get together as much as we can. This is how we dedicate ourselves to him. But we, as, as we've already said, and, and as I've addressed before, and, and even as somebody got in touch with me before, um, that's not to put condemnation on anybody that has to miss a service for any particular reason when it's not just throwing excuses out there. Okay, verse 26. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fearier, fiery indignation which shall devour the adversities. So the certain unescapable judgment of those who reject the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, okay? Why? Because there's not an alternate. There's, right. there's, there's okay. not anything else that's going to be offered. Okay, you had the Old Testament, and, and you have Jesus, and there's not anything coming after Jesus to offer another means of salvation, another means of hope. That's right. Okay, so we're going to end it right there with verse 27. We'll finish up chapter 10 and bring it into chapter 11 next week, which speaks of faith and those who live for God by faith. I do encourage you to read ahead in chapter 11. Uh, it's very encouraging. Very encouraging. But let's close tonight in prayer. Thank you, Father God, for what you've given us tonight through your word, for this encouragement, God, that we have that relationship with you by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ who made a way for us to come unto you personally, not through another intermediary, not through any works of our own, but just by faith in what you have done for us. Move in our lives, Lord Jesus. Accomplish your purpose through us. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you this evening. God bless you. That was...